Thank you and welcome back to our final session, which is a panel. Um, we have lots and lots of questions. I will do my best to get through those. Please be patient with us. But I do want to just reintroduce Amy, Angel, Dr. Hammond, and for the first time introduce Diana Kimmel, who, who joins us as a long-term volunteer for the organization. She's also a person living with idiopathic hypersomnia. So um, by all means, do continue to add some questions. We will get to those if we possibly can. So the first question I have um, is, if I want to start a support group in my area, what should I do? And I wonder, Diana, if that's a question for you. Um, sure. Um, wanting to do it is the first step. And then um, deciding on whether you want to do something in person or Zoom. Um, I actually do something kind of hybrid now. Sometimes I meet in person, but I do a lot of Zoom. COVID kind of brought that about. Um, my best advice is that decide how often you want to meet and be sure that that can fit what you can handle. So if maybe that's every other month, maybe that's once a quarter, and then work up to if you want to do monthly, because consistency is really the most important thing. Once the um, community that you're serving knows on this date, at this time, you're going to meet, everything else all falls together. Um, for me, having a support group is as much for my self-help and building my own support village, which is incredibly important to me, as well as helping others. Um, I, uh, I basically just do open dialogue. We talk just about what's affecting us at most at that moment, um, something somebody's having a problem with, we build on that. There are times that I have a special guest, like Angel has uh, been a part of my support group meeting and has been able to ask questions. I've had doctors um, attend as well. Again, you can make it as small or as big as you want it to be. Um, just availability, is it's, it's so appreciated in the community. If anybody ever, wants help with it, I am more than happy to help um, out starting up one. I'm actually starting helping one um, in the Pacific, uh, upper Pacific coast. That should be starting in April. But you can email info at hypersomniafoundation.org and they can get you in touch with me. Mm -hmm. Where can people find your support group if they just want to go online and find <laughs> out where you are? So Mine is in Atlanta and um, I do have a Facebook group, Atlanta Hypersomnia Support Group. You could find me there easily. And um, again, mm -hmm. info at hypersomniafoundation.org okay. will get you in touch with me yeah. if you can't find me on Facebook. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Uh, we will direct any um, detailed questions on email through the info at address to Diana. Okay, I have a question about brain fog. And this came up, um, I think, Amy, during your presentation. Um, so I'll read that. So your story, Amy, mirrored mine. I was a competitive dancer and minored in dance and my symptoms were manageable, but I could sleep standing up. Was yet to be diagnosed. Grad school, I noticed a significant increase. Do you feel that it was a correlate? there was a correlation decline in physical activity resulted in, a, in, in increased symptoms? I was diagnosed in my late 30s after attempting to obtain my doctorate. The brain fog is causing my doctorate program to pause. I need help with brain fog if anyone can help. So I'm sure between you and Dr. Hammond, brain yeah. fog, any comments on that? That's a really good point. I don't think I ever really thought about the decline in physical activity from you know undergrad to grad school. It could definitely be related, um, but I haven't I tried to explore it. Um, I think... Uh, you know, the the first time I ever really saw um, brain fog described in a way that I experienced it was in Dr. Hammond's slides where it was like the, um, was it losing, losing your, like not being, your mind going blank. I think that's what it said. And um, that really resonated with me. Um, I, I think again, too, like, you know, being in a more intense program, like a doctorate program is, is just going to be really, really intense. tough and you can do it. <laughs> um, definitely. But um yeah, I don't know if I have any advice, okay. really. I'm not sure if we've identified a correlation exactly. Um, uh, that includes physical activity, emotional factors, a stress of a variety. 
Um, what we do see pivotal is perhaps exposure to certain viruses and illness that certainly have an impact, but really remain unexplained. To answer the question, I don't think there's any correlation of increasing or excessive physical activity leading to conditions like IH. Um, I, I think our, we, we like to find cause and effect. And certainly those are probably times that symptoms are manifested because we are stressing the system. And so especially in schooling, when we're more likely to be very physical and then emotionally stressed and with sleepless nights or partly. And I think those are at least contributing factors in terms of how we feel. It doesn't necessarily mean that it uh, started the condition entirely. Okay, this is a question I think for Angel, um, referring to your earlier presentation on disability. How are individuals with symptoms so severe that they can no longer work supposed to support themselves financially while waiting up to two years to finally get approved for disability? That's a great question. Um, and from Social Security's perspective, unfortunately, they're not concerned. Um, you know, the process on their end is the process. From my perspective, um, I, you know, I really try to make sure that people are aware of options like short-term disability and long-term disability while they're still working so that in the event that they do become disabled, you know, according to Social Security's definition and have to go out of work, that instead of resigning from your job or being fired from your job, that you go ahead and you utilize the short-term disability that you've paid for um, or that your company has paid for and then utilize the long-term disability benefits. While you are out utilizing your short-term disability benefits, and I mean from day one, when you go out of work, apply for Social Security Disability. So while you are still receiving some income through your employer, even though you're not physically working, you are also applying for Social Security Disability and you're still able to maintain your income or some income. When you receive short-term or long-term disability, typically you're receiving about 60% um, of your income while you were physically working. So it is a reduction, but it's better than not having any income at all. If that is not an option to you, unfortunately, you will have to rely on the support of friends or family um, while you're going through the process. Or if you're able to find some part-time work, um, you know, every bit helps. And so if you're able to find some part-time work that you're able to sustain, then that can at least relieve a little bit of the financial um, burden while you're going through the disability process. But other than that, there aren't any other options, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. That's another sort of follow-up question, I think, Angel. I'm in the process and have been on my company's disability for three years. Thank God for long term. I already got denied once. I have IH among other things, but they didn't even use my two main reasons for my disability claim, breathing issues and muscle fatigue, but used a few of my other chronic issues that aren't even as severe. Any reason you think they may have done that? So... I don't know um, because we're talking about the long-term disability. So long-term disability insurers, they have their own rules, which are distinct from Social Security. So they have an entirely different process of qualifying you for benefits. Um, what I would recommend that you do is to consult with a long-term disability um, attorney to see you know, what your options are. But, you know, if you're continuing to receive the benefits, that's a good thing. Um, although it may not be for the conditions that you find to be most severe, you won't get any additional funds. For example, if they say, yes, we're going to add IH to it, you won't get any additional funds. Um, so I think it's, it's important to note that it's a good thing that you're receiving benefits, but 
if for some reason those benefits are going to end, it, it will be important for you to talk with a long-term disability attorney and try to figure out, you know, there are some exclusions that some policies have. Um, I, you know, I don't know if the IH is an exclusion or if perhaps there just wasn't enough information for them to reach any sort of conclusion on the severity of the IH, but they had other conditions that um, by their standards were severe enough to get you the disability benefits. Okay, we have one, one more here. What or who would be a good resource for someone already approved for SSDI is not yet at retirement age, but who through a death is eligible for widows slash survivors benefit? Eventually taking the award could be helpful because of more income, but it will also hurt because of resources, rent, et cetera, and income cutoff guidelines and requirements. In essence, the award creates a hardship. Who should I be talking to? Social Security says they can only tell me if I'm eligible and what award would be. So if you are currently receiving disability benefits, um, the first thing to, to make sure of is that the terminology is correct, um, that you're receiving SSDI um, or are you receiving SSI? If you are receiving SSI and you become eligible for widow's benefits, then Social Security is going to require you to receive those widow's benefits. SSI, because it's an income and asset sensitive program, if you become eligible for another program, you know, through Social Security, they make you um, go ahead and switch over to that program so, they'll, that, so that they can take you off of the SSI. If on the other hand, you are receiving SSDI and you may be eligible to receive more money from the widow's benefits, then you'll want to consult with SSI, or excuse me, with SSA, with Social Security. Make sure that you know how much money you're entitled to with the widow's benefits, and they can help you weigh the options um, to see which would be most beneficial for you. Okay, um, and here, Jewel says, should I speak to an attorney before or after my first application? And are you taking new clients? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Atlanta and I've heard your name come up before. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I am always accepting new clients. So feel free to reach out to me. My personal preference as an attorney, and there are other attorneys who will disagree with me, um, is I like to, if at all possible, start working with you before an application is filed. Because I want to make sure that the correct application is filed, that the correct information is provided to Social Security, so that there won't be anything down the road that we need to try and fix. Now, most things we can fix, but some things we can't. So that is my personal preference. Um, there are other attorneys, actually a lot of attorneys, that will say to you, I can't help you until you get a denial. So it really boils down to your personal preference. Um, you know, do you want to kind of undertake on your own applying for benefits, making sure you submit the right forms, make sure the correct information is provided? Um, if that seems daunting, you're not alone. Um, and I'm happy to talk with you. So please contact me. Thank you. And again, if you um, want to get hold of us at info at, we can direct any inquiries to Angel. Um, okay, so this is an anonymous um, attendee, I think, for you, Dr. Hammond. And the question says, this is an embarrassing question because of how severe my IH is. I experience nighttime bedwetting because I'm incapable of waking up to relieve myself. Would adult pull-ups be something a doctor could prescribe? I never knew the whole thing with prescribing Fitbits and stuff. Well, a condition called enuresis, and that's just nocturnal wet bedding, common with kids, adults less common, but usually secondary. In kids, it can just be on its own. It's kind of a leftover uh, from you know, early childhood development until maybe eight, usually at latest 10 years old, and that's considered normal, relatively. Uh, for adults with acquired enuresis, it's often secondary. And so the question on specific to idiopathic hypersomnia, of course, uh, if a person has such sleep stupor or, uh, and, and that sleep inertia, 
uh, they're unable to respond to uh, common cues, and, and such as a full bladder. And so that can happen, and it can happen to other conditions, including obstructive sleep apnea, and that's actually more common. So if this person has not had a complete evaluation, I would suggest looking at other factors that can contribute to enuresis. And now there are medications. And so that would be consulting with your physician in regards to managing uh, uh, the enuresis, meaning what can you take to help reduce a full bladder? Um, or what are behaviors we can do, and, and that might be common sense, but in terms of limitation of fluid intake at a certain time, and, and then maybe even having scheduled bathroom visits at night. But if you have a hard time responding, waking up to a full bladder, you might have a hard time waking up to an alarm as well. So, mm -hmm. um, But to note, there are, there are medications that can help, so it's something to consider. Okay, thank you. Okay, another um, medical question. I think, do genetic markers for narcolepsy matter with IH? Oh, the answer is no. Um, the genetic markers, HLA subtype, the haplotypes, um, we've identified uh, one major one with narcolepsy. Um, but the, we haven't identified any crossover relationship with idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, no genes, to my knowledge, in terms of uh, isolating any genetic anomaly uh, with idiopathic hypersomnia to date, uh, but that could change soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a question um, between IH and depression, again, for Dr. Hammond, I think. In regard to psychiatric comorbidities, have studies investigated the course of the illness, illnesses? For example, does the sleep disorder proceed or follow psychiatric diagnosis? Wondering how often IH is misdiagnosed as depression, given some overlapping symptoms. Yeah, this is the conundrum. Uh, and quite often, and this bewildering in sleep medicine in general, and because there is such a large comorbidity and overlap among, among psychiatric problems. And, and so including idiopathic hypersomnia, as we pointed out, almost half of these patients have depression or anxiety, um, less common bipolar disorder. Um, however, uh, it's easy to, and, and we can speculate, but we have zero data, right? Uh, these are simply observational studies that are fairly new of people with IH that have comorbid psychiatric disease. Um, but there is a strong correlation with these. And yes, absolutely, a person could have a mood disorder that predates the diagnosis of IH. Uh, however, with good uh, retrospection, we may identify they probably had IH all this time. So with careful analysis, sure. But what we have so far are observational data uh, that we've gleaned from to suggest, okay, we have a, a significant risk of having comorbidities of this type, uh, but uh, we, and, and some idea on the prevalence. Uh, but in terms of actual the correlating with the, the timing of the diagnosis and preceding problems, uh, it's really just guesswork right now. Thank you. Um, so with regard to having IH and a general anesthetic, here's a question from Beth. Who do you suggest to help complete the anesthesia care plan? A primary care physician or a sleep specialist? Oh, heavens. <laughs> um, well, number one, like our dilemma we, we've discussed already is just a... Uh, uh, under or misinformation, even among medical professionals. And, and so, and I would assume also anesthesiologists and surgeons or other procedures may be less informed about IH. And so it may require uh, some involvement with the sleep specialist uh, because I, I suspect uh, surgeons in particular will not be quite at all familiar with IH. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that is a point of discussion that maybe they need to have with another medical professional that understands IH. But then I think patients really need to be their own advocate. And so maybe asking those questions specific to the anesthesiologist, to the procedures, are you familiar with IH? Are you familiar with the potential complications? 
and uh, these medicines that may interact with the anesthesia, opiates, among other therapies. So I, I would encourage patients to be their own advocate um, and to help these procedures be aware because the chances are they're not going to be. And in addition, uh, logistically, trying to get a sleep medicine physician connected with the surgeon, that's a challenge in itself. Uh, everybody's busy. And, and so if anything, be your own advocate. Okay, it's a great message. And that speaks very much to, to Amy's presentation as well, be your own advocate. Okay, I think this might have been addressed, but I don't want to miss it. Is there a link to concussions in later having IH? Or perhaps that means in developing IH at a later date? Yeah, good. Uh, and the question is, uh, with those that have TBI, traumatic brain injury, is there a risk of IH? Well, certainly the symptoms of IH do overlap considerably. Now, uh, we do have an exclusion uh, in neurology if, if patients have a neurological disorder that uh, essentially is their diagnosis. You know, having IH symptoms, though, uh, and it still can be. So TBI, yes, they have IH symptoms, but would we diagnose IH? Maybe some would, but uh, essentially a primary neurological disorder trumps uh, an acquired setting of something like IH, where TBI does readily explain hypersomnolence, uh, very common. And so can we have a dual diagnosis? Maybe, and that, could, that would require history taking. So perhaps they had IH symptoms before the TBI, and then we might have a dual diagnosis. Otherwise, we probably are left with complications of TBI. Thank you. Um, what are the methods, this is from Alyssa online, what are the methods used to wake up in the morning? We've tried vibrating alarms, loud alarms, electric shock alarms, and all have failed. Are there any other strategies or products we can try besides hiring someone to wake you up? Thank you. Diana, do you want to try and address that one? I think that hit all of them. Um, it's hard. I mean, it, it's hard to wake up. And I mean, alarms, the best is what you just said, hire somebody or have somebody. I don't, I don't have any other answers because it is tough. And some of those alarms you just get used to and they can go, just keep going off and going off. So I definitely sympathize with it. Um, just have to probably keep changing it up. So the tone, the sound is different and you're reacting to it. Amy, have you got any insights there? No, just to <laughs> give yourself grace and um, just keep trying. <laughs> Thank you, it's a tough one. Ice pocket. <laughs> An ice bucket. <laughs> That's what I do for my kids. Exactly. <laughs> okay, ice bucket. That's the new one. Um, Okay, so an anonymous, an, an anonymous question. Any advice for people with multi-morbidities, multi IH, POTS, diabetes, etc., that take multiple medications and symptoms that clash with one another? Hmm. Well, I, I rarely find... Uh, there, there's always going to be drug interactions, of course, but a treating autonomic dysfunction is really kind of its own separate category because we're largely not dealing with uh, psychotropic therapies, medicines that work on the brain. And, and so uh, quite often, and I do have uh, good success managing dysautonomia, the autonomic nervous system problems, and largely what we're using are basal pressors, um, and these are kind of like blood pressure medicines to pump up the blood pressure in a sense. Um, we may use other agents, and so we're kind of working from a different category of therapeutics entirely, but you can always have drug to drug interactions, that, that is possible. But what I found at treating dysautonomia, if I can get more blood to the brain, it kind of wakes us up, doesn't it? Um, and, and so for those that do have autonomic dysfunction, if we can address that, uh, then I, I think we're complementing therapy that we're using to treat IH. Okay. Thank you. Um, so from Cheryl, we have, so doctors years back stopped giving me ProVigil and NuVigil since it seemed not to work. Could it have been due to my initially being on birth control for migraines and later for being on HRT after menopause? So a question about ProVigil and NuVigil and its interaction during menopause or HRT or birth control. 
Yeah, there, there's a, about 18%, if I remember correctly, um, interacting, uh, well, the modafinil essentially uh, inducing enzyme activity of about 18% on uh, uh, estradiol specifically, uh, and estrogens composed in oral contraceptive therapy. So in effect, modafinil reduces the effect of uh, uh, oral contraceptive therapies uh, by that margin. Um, in terms of other therapies, I, I don't, I'm not sure of other studies regarding hormonal therapies, um, but the estradiols, as where I'm familiar with the studies that have been done specific to modafinil. Uh, there are other weight-promoting agents that don't have so much of that effect. Um, uh, we see that, though, with uh, some interaction with WakeX in addition to ProVigil in terms of interacting with enzymes at that level. Thank you. And a question from Kim about getting a spinal tap. Um, She's curious as to how she would go about getting the spinal fluid tested. I've always wondered why that's not just part of the initial diagnostic criteria, as I often find myself questioning my diagnosis, even though my symptoms and development of my IH have always been pretty textbook. Why isn't the spinal tap part of typical diagnostic journey? Well, the, the leading concern is we haven't seen consistencies um, with IH. Uh, for those particular meeting clinical and electrographic criteria for IH in terms of spinal fluid outcomes, we haven't seen consistencies looking at GABA A, GABA B, and other properties within the spinal fluid. I, I believe that still uh, is in the works. I'm sure we're looking at other uh, components in the spinal fluid. But as of now, it's not a requirement for the diagnosis. And by the way, uh, spinal taps are not necessarily benign. And so it's, although I do many of those in my office, um, they, they can have complications. Um, and some of those complications can be permanent. And so it's not a convenient and it can be a very expensive a diagnostic assessment. Insurance companies are not happy about covering it. And, and the utility remains unknown. So it is not a practice of mine. I do believe we need more research. Thank you. Um, and Jennifer asks, can you talk a little bit more about the effects on hormones with the meds used for IH? I have a trans son that is on hormones as he has IH as well. I am unfamiliar with those types of hormones. Again, I'm only familiar with okay. uh, uh, estradiol types that we see with oral contraceptive therapies. And that's on limited studies regarding ProVigil, Wakex. Okay, thank you. Anyone got any comments on that question? It's a difficult one to answer, I think. Um, so Sheila says, with a chronic issue like IH, a counselling support system is important. Why isn't there a way to identify counsellors who understand this disease to help those with IH with lifestyle issues? There is so much labelling with the uneducated counsellors. <laughs> do you want to try and do that one, Diana? <laughs> yeah. So the question is, why is there not um, counsellors? A way to find a counsellor? Um, counsellors who understand IH and well i think inherently we don't have the doctors the pcps the sleep doctors that don't they don't understand ih so going to a um you know a therapist or a uh, counselor it's probably going to be less likely um i do know i mean of dr munt mm -hmm. that um does some cognitive behavior yeah. therapy right. for ih specific mm -hmm. um you can look her up she's um, at northwestern i think I do. I do yeah. believe so. So, um, and I, I think she'll share information with mm -hmm. another therapist. I think maybe you'd have to look into that yeah. further. I wonder whether just the resources, sorry, Diane. I was just going to say, sometimes it'll help if you look for a therapist who treats chronic illnesses. Right. And they should be open to being referred to educated professionals who understand the disease. Right. Um, and right. So that's helpful, finding a specialist who um, actually is familiar with chronic disease, chronic disorders, chronic health issues. Uh, it's probably a good place to start. Um, and education, I think, 
in terms of, again, advocating for ourselves and taking information about IH to, to our healthcare providers and our counsellors, but that's unfortunate. I think just, that's, sorry. Do you I just to want to add, I think, you know, finding a therapist or counselor that is a good fit in general is a really difficult thing and it's so important. And, um, you know, just adding the, the chronic illness and have, making sure someone un understands yeah. that is really, really important. All right, any other questions? I think we're almost there. Um, I did want to extend thanks again to all those who've helped set today up, particularly our presenters, Dr. Hammond, Angel, Amy, Rebecca, King has left the room for now, and Diana for joining us for the panel. Um, and to our sponsors again, for enabling us to pull off this event and for providing us with resources to um, continue with our programs and events for the rest of this year. So please do join us for Unite. Um, look us up on social media and sign up for our newsletter, as we mentioned. Our website is a great resource um, that's there all the time. So we very much look forward to meeting with you at these events and online. So thank you.